Uh, Dr. Anuptar is an associate professor at the School of Human Studies, Ambedkar University, Delhi. He has just completed a book manuscript titled Psychoanalysis and Sex Relation in Cultural Crucible, Genealogies of Upper Generalizations. He is currently co-editing a volume titled Psychoanalysis from the Indian Terror with Anurag Mishra and Mansi Kumar. Professor Ashish Nandi is trained in sociology and clinical psychology, and his research interests have centered on political and cultural psychology of human violence, cultures of knowledge, visions and utopias, and scientific creativity. <coughs> Professor Nandi is a fellow and former director of the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi, distinguished fellow of Institute of Postcolonial Studies, Melbourne. He is also the chairperson of the Centre for Environment and Food Security, Delhi, and a member of Governing Council of the Indian Council of Social Science Research. He has been Woodrow Wilson Fellow, Woodrow Wilson International Centre, Washington, 1988, Fellow Institute for Advanced Studies in Humanities, the University of Edinburgh, 1991, UNESCO Professor, Centre for European Studies, University of Trier, Germany, 1994, Regents Fellow, University of California, Los Angeles, 1997. Fellow Wishen Krafton, University for Advanced Study, Berlin, 2004 and 2006. And has also held a fellowship in South Asian Alternatives from the year 1995 to 2000. Presently, he is in the editorial boards of about 30 Indian, South Asian and international journals. Some of Professor Nandi's books are Alternative Sciences, Creativity and Authenticity in Two Indian Scientists, 1980 and 1995, At the Edge of Psychology, Essays on Politicals and Culture, 1980, The Intimate Enemy, Loss and Recovery of Self under Colonialism, 1983, Traditions, Tyranny and Utopias, Essays in the Politics of Awareness, 1987, <coughs> The Savage Freud and Other Essays in Possible and Retrievable Selves, 1995 among many others. His most recent work has been The Genes of Narcissism and The Genes of Despair, 2013. Professor Nandi has worked for more than 35 years on the two diametrically opposite domains of social existence, human potentialities and human destructiveness. In his ongoing study of genocide in South Asia, the emphasis is not only on human destructiveness, but also on the resistance offered by ordinary people to organize machine violence and ethno-nationalism. This has also brought him close to social movements and non-state political actors grappling with issues of peace, human rights, environment, intercultural dialogue, and cultural survival. Apart from this, Professor Nandi is also known for his work in political cultures and future studies. So could I request you to please come on stage? I was happy. Rashi did not start the introduction saying Ashish Nandi needs no introduction. <laughs> it's the usual way to introduce and then introduce for, a long, long. Introduce for a long, long time. Um, uh, uh, just a one-liner I pick up from your uh, Bengali conversation, conversation in Bengali with uh, Prof. Jayanti Basu. He says in that conversation, he sees psychoanalysis as language, uh, not English. Bengali, but psychoanalysis as language, and I thought that was an interesting way of inviting you uh, to speak on Freud's ghosts. Uh, and I think I will speak, speak from here. Uh, if you can pull it back a little bit, I shall be very grateful. So I can see. <coughs> <the face. laughs> Bengali, so I think better when I sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
Basically, <coughs> uh, I'm very sorry to see so many people standing and sitting on the floor. Uh, I wish it was not so. Uh, Frank, I am afraid that my steady decline into respectability has been disturbing me for the last few years. Uh, and the more this happens, more I am become disinclined to speak in public. But that's another story. It's too late to think about it. Uh, I was told that, actually I suggested that there be a panel discussion this year as a change. Uh, and they said, okay, you start it off. <laughs> but now I find that uh, I'm the sole lecturer here. Uh, Anup may come in with his uh, wise comments later on. But that's another two minutes. Um, okay. Uh, I must also warn you that uh, I will not read out the talk. I will speak. And it is going to be quite boring. But I hope it will give you clues to the ways one can locate as a person living in the southern hemisphere in one of the Afro-Asian countries could possibly look at Freud and could find him relevant to our time. And that choice, that perspective is important because this is 10 years after the 150th <coughs> birth anniversary of Freud and during the 150th year and later on for like two or three years, there was a plethora of books, articles, special numbers on Freud. Unfortunately, I must frankly admit, I found them quite flat. Because in the name of paying homage, they had tried to domesticate Freud and make him a part of our lives because they were feeling that a person born 150 years could not do so on his own. He is not there to speak for himself. This is not my aim. Because I do notice that there is a crucial difference between the sciences and the, and the world of social knowledge, social scientists, sciences and humanities. Though the social scientists try very hard to imitate the scientists, physics is the queen of disciplines in the contemporary world. Nevertheless, the fact remains that there are crucial differences between the sciences and social sciences. Sciences are ahistorical. Social scientists are not. In social sciences, the history of knowledge, the history of knowledge systems, or the past of knowledge systems, if you like to liberate it from the clutches of history itself, is an important part. In sciences, they are not. This is, there are a lot of university students in this room if you do not believe me, go to your department of physics and ask who Ptolemy was. <laughs> I can guarantee you a majority of them will not know that. No, no, no answer. One or two might say casually that he was the father of physics, ancient physicist. If you tell them to spell his name, you will find nobody answering it correctly. There is a P in front of T. <laughs> so Ptolemy is difficult to spell. 
This is because science goes through a process where the past is scanned and consumed and integrated, if you can say so, or superseded, and then you forget it. Then you forget it. Unless you belong to one of the Asian or African countries, <coughs> perpetually trying to redeem your self-respect <laughs> by referring to some ancient scholar <laughs> and, you know, who did wonderful things. There is nothing in between them and the present times. The recent heartthrob of Indians is Chanakya. <laughs> but not because they really are interested in Chanakya, they are actually interested in Machiavelli. <laughs> he has a theory of real politics, hard politics. And Chanakya is an Indian Machiavelli. So it is secondary, uh, secondary status of Chanakko, which they are interested in. At one time, they used to call Tagore an Indian Shelley. So, so this is the world in which we live. In social knowledge, persons do not die. They might become irrelevant for a while. They might go into near oblivion. They might be marginalized, but they come back. Freud, for instance, has undergone a serious process of marginalization. In medical sciences, his presence has <coughs> diminished dramatically. There are still psychiatrists who are Freudians too, but they are not that many. You might even say that outside United States and West Europe, they are, and probably your whole of Europe, they are even less important. But he has also made a triumphant entry into literary theory, metapsychology, cultural studies now into studies of cinema and popular culture. Because that's the way it goes on in social knowledge. Because new interpretations of the person emerge, new uses are found for him, and what you do with him partly depends on you. You decide how to use him. There is no powerful convention of how you must use it. There may be dominant trends, but you may, do not, may not have to like to be a part of the dominant trend. So Plato also lives. In, in fact, Freud is called sometimes a crypto -plato, uh, platonic thinker. I, I, Iris Murdoch once said it. Now, Plato is 2,000 years old. When you say he's a, there's something platonic about Freud's work, you have a certain, certain kind of concept of what that means. <coughs> and that's the way the ancients live. Not the original ancients as a fixed, known, entity who can be read only in one way. But as a plural person himself, he is not one person, he becomes a plurality of persons, plurality of selves, which successive generations have discovered for themselves. That's a different way of living or surviving. But that's the way the great thinkers survive in social knowledge. The world which we are living, and I now move to that part of the story, is dominated by the Enlightenment values. 
the enlightenment values are something like 250 to 300 years old. And this enlightenment, enlightenment world, or you can call it the enlightenment tinged world, which defines the dominant values in global public culture. There are four individuals who are seen as iconic figures and can be used in various ways. Incidentally, two of them are also scientists, but they are used differently in social knowledge. Darwin, Marx, <coughs> Freud, and who else? Einstein. Now, Einstein, even in social sciences, is not the same as is used in science. Darwin's use is not the same as it in biology, or ethology for that matter. It's a different kind of use. In fact, of these four, in many ways, Darwin proved to be the most dangerous one because he gave us the theory of evolution, which was shifted from biology and species redefinitions to the area of so the social world. So that now we have a hierarchy of cultures, civilizations, societies, economies, politics, virtually everything under the sun including human life cycle. Because you are evolving. That which was in horizontal and different, which defined variety and variation, became part of a world which you presume now. You are no longer surprised by differences now. If you go to a new country, you are not impressed by the flora and fauna of the country, you are not impressed by the society they have, or the thoughts they have, or the music, or the <coughs> nature, the flora and the fauna. All new geographical and cultural entities have become a part of the known world. Either the others whom you find are what you were yesterday, or they are somewhere who, what you will become tomorrow. So that which was horizontal has been made into a vertical plane. That's the way historical evolution is supposed to take place. So we are all, I, as I often say, are climbing, clawing our way up a hill. There are some people sitting on the top advising us how to climb it and others are below us, and we are very proud that we are above them. <laughs> the human future has been decided, and human future has been settled. So there is no need to study different futures and different concepts of desirable societies the world over, because they, it is all the same. Uh, sometimes when I am frustrated, I say, one billion Chinese and one billion Indians. When they die after a virtuous life, do not go to heaven, they go to New York. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the work. But I don't want to go into that part of the story. But Darwin's work vitiated the work of the other three. Einstein's concept of relativity was kept only for science. Other kind of relativity came much later in a truncated form in a different way. All differences and all relativism was seen in terms of the Darwinian evolution, but it was called social evolution. You should read some of the great um, novelists and thinkers and writers of India talking about Harvard Spencer, who was a 
uh, um, fountainhead of that kind of Darwinism, social Darwinism, you might call it, as, as people have called it. So, to some extent, Marx falls in the same category because he was an admirer of Darwin. He dedicated his major work to Darwin. He also saw societies in terms of historical evolution. Perhaps that is the reason why Freud has remained in some ways usable in other ways. Because though he was tinged by that, social evolutionism, his theory and his meta-theory was more open for us to work with him differently. And that's how he survives. Marcuse's use of repression in two senses. Repression as keeping something repressed in your mind, not allowing it to enter your own, own consciousness, and repression in the sense of oppression in society. That also is repression. Now, this double use of repression, you will not find in Freud. And true-blooded scholars should, will, should find it absurd that somebody can give attribute this meaning and solve themselves so. But that did not stop Marcuse from writing it, and Marcuse for a while became a very important critic of our times, very important theoretician. The 1968 Students' Rebellion in Europe and America was, in, in a sense, uh, he, uh, he was the, one of the guiding lights of it, and so on and so forth. So this kind of fluidity, this kind of play, was probably not possible to solve that. As Marx now is coming back in a different guise, in a different way, very differently. But he did not leave so much behind a very open-handed theoretical frame. So, and particularly his political activism sought to free it. Because you know, in, in, in a very mechanical, uh, in a mechanical way, and that did uh, has allowed him to be dated uh, badly. One of my friends was grumbling that it has been that marginalization of Marx is being taken to absurd limits now. His son went to Sorbonne University in Paris, and once he had mentioned Marx and. Uh, two of his class fellows thought he, they was talking, he was talking of Groucho Marx, <laughs> as the American comedy. Uh, so there is that part of the story. Uh, point here, that the Enlightenment vision is supposed to have given the world the final answers for all times to come. We are now supposed to only write uh, footnotes to it. <laughs> no other country, no other civilization has any right to uh, interfere with that vision of life. But Marx, they are also, unlike all the other three, Marx was the only one there was the scope in Marx, uh, sorry, not Marx, the scope in Freud for, the, for taking a position against Enlightenment vision also and he strangled out. And this came partly because though he is called a German Jew, Freud's ancestor came from Eastern Europe, and the Hasidic tradition <coughs> of East Europe had a very important role to play, not in his self-conscious self, but in his, uh, it has cast a shadow on his work. He did not uh, uh, acknowledge it because he was a child of the Enlightenment and considered any admission of that part of the story to be a, 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 a cop-out, 
a, 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 an admission that what he was saying is not was not scientific or not and will not would was afraid that it would be not accepted but every knowledge system has a darker underside to it to which those who are founders of the system are often not aware and in freud's case that that openness gave him a play which allowed him to survive even the experiences of colonialism and the two world wars i might here say that if you compare freud with carl jung you will find that carl jung knew much more under, uh, about indian civilization <coughs> he had read indian classics he visited india twice he established two departments of psychology in india helped to establish them one in calcutta applied psychology and one in banaras he was well versed with indian classics and its subtleties as far as the psychological part of the story goes but indian showed very little interest in him they were interested in freud the reason for that i am now convinced is that the indians at that time were more confident than they are now <laughs> that we are at that time they were not looking for testimonials from western great western thinkers they were looking for tools of criticizing their own society tools for criticizing what they were seeing around them tools for attacking what they considered crucial forms of unreason irra or irrationality crucial forms of superstition crucial form of absurdities which exist in this society i mean you can be very critical of superstitions a very critical of the village uh, astrologer who dupes you by telling promising to tell your future uh, of 20 rupees but you may be very uncritical about the multinational uh, cosmetic farms who <laughs> promise you eternal youth <laughs> and spend thousands of rupees huh, without feeling cheated at all you once i started as a spare time and as a just you know fun to find out because this united states this cosmetic uh, counters give you this whole list of tooth uh, whatever lipsticks and the shades what are the shades available i collected few and i gave up after a while because they already came uh, extended to more than something like 2500 or 3000 i gave up because i i was i, I was convinced what i suspected that human retina is not capable of registering 3 to 4000 or 5000 whatever it might be ultimate count might be of different shades of lipstick you know but you buy them nonetheless so there is that kind of thing so there is this part of the story <coughs> and the early freudians knew that and i have two uh, two instances which will show you that many of the things which we shall consider unpardonable were done by them one was this that one of the early psychoanalysts there is you know rogi dhalda who wrote 
an analysis of Tagore writings, and that time in psycho and psychosexual on the side. At that time, it was very quite for the it was orthodox Freud, Freud and none of this ego psychology and the later developments and you know, more subtler. Then it was very direct psychosexual interpretation of Tego's writings in Bengali. It was highly appreciated, even Tego appreciated it. So he then translated it to English and presented it the next. Indian Science Congress annual conference. Today, if he had done so, he would have been sued for hurting the sentiments <laughs> of all Bengalis. <laughs> so, there is that. The second example, I had a colleague whose aunt was a widow and always wore white, very conservative, very orthodox, but wrote Bengali very well. And Sarushilal Sarkar, another psychoanalyst in the first batch of psychoanalysts in India, he was translating Freud into Bengali and would, he, he was her brother. So this, my colleague who told me this, she, she, said, she said to me, that he would say the English thing and she would quickly translate it to Bengali. Uh, and, and I would have thought, and she thought, that she would have thought that it would have been very uncomfortable for her to translate the kind of things uh, they were writing about. But she was not perturbed at all. In a sense, Freud's work was very provocative to Victorian England, in England, in India. That part of the story never had much of a run. There were people who objected. There were people who staged plays making fun of Freud. But they were very few. Most others had a very healthy, robust <coughs> approach to Freud, unlike in Victorian England. And they also had another part of the story which you cannot even say about the in, in Freud's Western admirers. Like, for example, if you no, Bruno Bettelheim's work, if you have read on Freud, he made very severe attacks on uh, Freud's English translation and written strategy. And the, uh, the English psychoanalysts were very close to Freud. Because in each case, he found that, Bettelheim found, that the German, from German, by translating from German to in, in, uh, English, they have tried to take away the th main thrust <coughs> from you, some, the, some aspects of the original concept. Like, for example, Freud's concept of the self, Freud's concept of identity and ego, Originally, that the translation can be had a clear touch of the English word soul. But if they use the word soul, it will be seen at metaphysical, unscientific. Though, so they translated it as a very hard boiled, um, uh, toned down concept of the self. And Bedlam has other such examples. I don't want to go into that. I, I, otherwise, I will be wasting too much of time on that. So, but here, perhaps because some of Freud's concepts are in some sense uh, uh, 
not incompatible or not terribly shocking if you are aware of the text on Tantra. Hmm? Both in Eastern Indian Tantra and Mahayana Tantra. No. So many scholars were aware of these things. It was not that they had not come. It was very strange to them. Finally, I will also point out to you, I once did about one Mirinda Shagar Bose, and I found, he was the founder of psychoanalysis in India, and I found that in case of Mirinda Shagar, his Bengali writings and English writings are very different in style. In the Bengali writings, he is much more himself. And sometimes, even when he doesn't use Freudian concepts, they come back indirectly and more powerfully in Gindra Shekhar's work. And this was perhaps because Gindra Shekhar was very aware whom he was writing for when he wrote in English. He was one of the editors of International Psychonautic what is it called? International Psych huh? Indian Journal of Psychology. 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 Whatever. The William Allen's invite. He was aware. So he had these double ledgers. And his exchanges with Freud, only scraps are available because he was also psychoanalyzed by Freud indirectly. But all, the whole entire exchange was lost when the ship by which they were sending it to England to be published got torpedoed during World War II. And all traces of the, that manuscript vanished. But there are conversations between Freud and exchanges of letters between Freud and Gene the Shekhar Bose where Freud is saying that that are, are, we are very proud that you are here with Amadas, and we also find that your writings are uh, uh, philosophically very sensitive to the demands of psychoanalysis. I doubt, sometimes he says, I sometimes have doubts whether our infant discipline can, can take that much of load of philosophy. But one thing happened. Whether as a result of his encounter with in the chair, or his, or or his, uh, uh, how should I say, for him. All his more imaginative and daring works, the works by which he is mainly being read now, now, why what? His exchange of letter with Einstein, uh, then uh, Moses and monotheism, uh, then uh, what else? Civilization. Hmm? Civilization. Civilization and discontents, and so on and so forth. About five of them or six of them. There. They all came in later stage. Partly because he was more self confident by that time himself. And partly probably before dying, he wanted to leave back his legacy and his larger uh, worldview for the uh, next generations. But he did. And it is these works which he was hesitant about, which he thought detracted from his scientific status, have given him a new lease of life. And some of these works are very daring, and they also allow him to look at the problem of human violence in a different way, in a much more macroscopic fashion. Not in terms of his individual case studies, but his, his insights into the human process. You will find 
very little of the positivist Marx in these works. Marx was not a positivist, but sometimes he almost pretended to be so. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. So this is the other part of the story. There is a lovely story which I once used for something about Girinda Shekhar Bose's daughter going to meet him in Vienna. And she was a very ordinary Bengali woman, educated, well read, but in total awe of Freud. As it happened, she was deadly scared of dogs. And when she went to Freud's place, he found, she found that Freud had dogs and was very fond of them. So Freud admitted that he was exceedingly fond of dogs, but also told her that if you are afraid of dogs, your father is a psychoanalyst, he should have explained to you, you should have interpreted it, why you are afraid of dogs. <laughs> so she didn't apply, she was shy and diffident, but let, writes in her book, in her, you know, when she wrote a memoir, you know, a book on the journey to Europe, she said, I didn't have the courage to tell him that one could also interpret your so, such acute love for dogs. <laughs> I think that's 